Welcome to the Tech Ranch, where we explore the world of living with technology. Get ready to take a deep dive into the latest gadgets, apps, and innovations with your hosts, the guru of geek, Marlo Anderson, and his trusty co-host, Steve Botkin. Join us on this exciting journey, and don't forget to visit thetechranch.com for even more exclusive content. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Marlo and Steve to the Tech Ranch. You're tuned to the Tech Ranch. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Bakken and uh, Marlo Anderson out and about today. And we've got a special guest, Dave Blair, joining us on the program today. And uh, Dave, how are your uh, threads this morning? <laughs> or this afternoon or whatever time of the day. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was a while back. I was a uh, I co-hosted this with uh, with Marlo. So you, I think I took your name, Rock and Dave, <laughs> the Rock and Bakken. Rock and Bakken's pretty cool. Well, I, I I won't hold that against you. So are you familiar with Threads? The, the well, latest, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's deemed as the Twitter killer. So yeah. it's the latest from uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Meta. Not a Facebook it, product. It's it's Meta. Yep. Interesting. Um, no, you know, and there's so many new platforms coming out there. You know, uh, President Trump launched his uh, his uh, app here. What about a year ago? Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know what kind of popularity there is. I think people get used to one thing, and they kind of stick with it. But this threat uh, thread thing sounds. Uh, really interesting, and competition is good. We, we, I believe in that. So um, maybe you can give our listeners just a quick snapshot of of uh, of the uh, the Twitter killer. <laughs> well, they're a, deeming it as a good. Twitter killer. I don't I don't know if they actually will though. It's it's basically a, a Twitter clone and uh, it's now available. It can be accessed on iOS, Android, or the web and what it does is Threads allows users to create text-based posts with up to 500 characters. They can also share photos, upload videos up to five minutes long. Uh, I've looked at it. It looks pretty similar to Twitter uh, with uh, basically with an interface is kind of what it is uh, that gives users the option to like, comment, repost, and share threads. Well, from what I gather, just checking things out a little bit, uh, they've already received, what, 30 million signups? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's pretty impressive, you know. Uh, to uh, get, you know, to launch that and to have that many uh, uh, people signing up for their for that app. Well, I've talked to a lot of people that uh, given it a try already, and they're they're signing up just to check it out because um, it's it's not as much about replacing Twitter. It's just is there something new and exciting that's out there? Well, and I think we uh, we see that in in uh, society today, man. Everybody wants to check something new out. If it's a new restaurant, boom, everybody's there, okay? But sometimes they filter back into their comfort zone. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, what happens with threads. I mean, having a having a new uh, a, a a new competition out there, I think, makes everybody a little stronger. And, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, the society of looking at the celebrities and the journalists and the brands and everything like that, uh, you know, we're, you know, I think the big, the big thing will be is the, is the kids, uh, are they going to be able to attract enough kids, uh, to, uh, compete? Cause Twitter is a pretty popular, uh, app you know one of the things with it being a meta so it's uh, affiliated with facebook and instagram and the other platforms that meta formerly facebook now owns um, you can actually log in with your instagram username or create a brand new account 
Now, some of the constraints, uh, which they say they're going to uh, figure out later, Threads does not currently support ActivityPub, uh, but there are plans to integrate the protocol later down the line. Uh, the app is not available in the EU due to the EU's strict privacy regulations. Because uh, one of the things with Threads as well is um, for smaller kids, I, I believe the age is 12, under 12, those accounts are automatically private uh, when they sign up so a bigger question is is 12 too young to have a social media account hmm. i mean nowadays it seems like everybody's got one hell people's dogs have social media accounts well uh i think parents maybe are beginning more concerned about what their kids are uh listening to or what uh, what kind of apps they might have uh, on their phone, I hope they are anyway, because uh, it can get it can get pretty uh, pretty sticky out there. Um, you know, Elon when he bought Twitter, you know he uh, he made some you know pretty aggressive changes, and you know I'm I'm sure that uh, you'll see him maybe countering something along the lines, but. You know, with Twitter, you have some vulnerability because you don't uh, how much temporary a limit on how many content users can view each day. So, I don't know if that if that will change or not. But um, I guess we'll just have to watch uh, and see uh, what kind of uh, disruption uh threads might have uh to uh to twitter i am a little curious to see what happens uh because some of the numbers have been coming back and there's been a little bit of a drawdown in usership um for Instagram and some of the other social media platforms. Instagram really is one that's contracted a little bit. Um, and Threads is going to be very closely linked with Instagram. So it's going to be interesting to see if that's going to prop up some of the Instagram numbers uh, for users or if they're going to abandon the platform a little bit more uh, going over to this Threads platform. Uh, one of the things I always have some concern about, because I'm probably not going to go on to Threads. I just... I, I don't need more social media accounts. I'm, I'm kind of trying to uh, get out of the social media stuff if I don't have to be on it. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm eliminating some of that. I'm wondering how much fatigue might be out there with some of these new platforms that are coming up, like a Threads or um, is there fatigue with social media, I guess, Dave? Because... I don't plan on going on it because I I have fatigue from social media. If I could get rid of social media, I would. Um, but what's your take on that? Well, you know, there's so many avenues out there and so many different apps. I mean, I was looking at my phone the other day and how many apps I have on there. And then I realized uh, why I... Uh, have issues with my battery power running out. Uh, so I'm going to have to do some cleansing. But, uh, you know, like like I said, I, I think that there will be, um, you know, a, a really uh, a honeymoon period here uh, for threads. And uh, like you, I, uh, I'm pretty limited to the amount of time that I want to spend on um on a, a platform um like twitter um you know i'm i'm a more traditionalist kind of person man i i i love to talk to the person uh, if i can face to face which is becoming harder and harder but you know our society has grown up now into the whole uh atmosphere of uh getting on an app and uh, communicating that way. So, yeah, the social media, uh, it will be uh, interesting how they uh, how they address to that. And then the big thing, and you know this as well as anybody, Steve, is uh, the political arena will, um, you know, maybe be affected because uh, more and more of uh, – 
candidates are using uh, that those platforms to get their message out. So, so one of the things I, I think about all the time too is with the diversification of platforms. So there's more and more platforms all the time. Is it watering down the messaging? So it, when there was just Facebook or just Twitter um, messages from a political campaign or an ad perspective, um, they had a little bit more reach. So now you have to cover all these different platforms to get that same reach. So I, I, I see a lot of this is just watering down messages, which in some cases good, in some cases bad. Yeah. Well, you don't, I think in, in politics um, as well as just a normal business, you don't want to miss out on getting your message out there. So you might have to make sure that it's covered on all the platforms. Well, think how business has changed though, because uh, marketing and business. So you've got a new restaurant, say, or clothing shop, and you're going to be bringing out uh, this product line. You're trying to promote your business. Well, now instead of having a Facebook page and a Twitter account and an Instagram page, and uh, now you've got to have 20 different accounts to get the same reach. Yeah, I think that can be f frustrating. And then that marketing person has to really be on top of things to make sure that they're they're covered and they're getting that their message out there and uh, it's getting delivered to, uh, you know, the right age group uh, out there as well. So, uh, you know, as topics trend, you have to look at it from the standpoint of, you know, what are we missing out on? And uh, I think it's going to be, uh, um, and who knows, in another year, maybe there'll be another uh, competitor out there. But, uh, you know, it all comes down to how much money are you willing to spend to put a platform or an app together? And, uh, you know, when do you uh, think that it's run its course? Um, or when do you think that it's time to make a change? Well, it's interesting that you said uh, missing out because I've gotten to the point where what am I missing out on? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> you know, it, 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 if you don't know what you don't know. I, exactly. I, I may just go back to MySpace. <laughs> the Tech Ranch. Let's get back to discovering the latest in technology with the guru of geek. Marlo Anderson. Steve Bakken and uh, Dave Blair sitting in for Marlo today on the Tech Ranch. And uh, Dave, what kind of phone do you have? I have a Droid phone, uh, Samsung. Uh, I love it because uh, it takes really, really good pictures. Well, there may be a better camera out there for pictures. Well, that... I'm sure every year they're going to come out with something. That's, again, like we talked about competition. Well, they do get better every time. I mean, every iteration of a phone, it's... Um... Remember the days when you actually had to bring a camera to a concert or bring a camera to an event, and, and now you just have your phone? Yeah, you don't see too many people with cameras anymore. No, <laughs> or, unless they're the really video, big ones. Or video recorders. Uh, you know, you think back of the days and you had that big monster sitting on your shoulder. Uh, hey, now, that was cutting edge back in oh, the day. Oh, it was. It was. The fact I, that you could just lift it alone was cutting edge. I, I remember recording. Uh, we were down to Disney World with uh, family, and I uh, recording the whole thing. And I'm going, you know, I didn't get to experience Disney uh, World because I was looking through a little lens. <laughs> Everybody else got to visualize and feel the effects of that. So, you know, now with that phone, uh, it's easy to. Uh, uh, do recordings and the quality is incredible. Well, and then those big cameras, the the home movie cameras, then they turned into those little handy cams that fit in you. You put the strap on the back of your wrist and fit right in your hand. That made it really simple for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, with my grandson uh, being in the symphony, uh, I record a lot of uh, 
a lot of songs and that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I get kind of tired of holding even the even the phone up. Uh, to uh, making sure we're um, getting a good uh, image out there. But, uh, yeah, things have become a, a, a lot simpler, and uh, the quality has gotten so much so much better. So I hear there's a new phone. There is. One question, though. Don't you have the selfie stick that you turn the camera around? I, and... I do have that. <laughs> you know, that I can hold. Actually, I've used that a couple times, and I can do the two-handed uh, probing around and uh, videoing and stuff like that. Well, so. and you used to have to worry about keeping your phone steady so there wasn't any shake, and, and then the phones came along that would uh, eliminate that. Now you've got uh, the Google phone with the eraser bit on it, which um, now Google's getting even better. Uh, yeah. there's, there's a Pixel 8 Pro coming out, and uh, there's some photos that have been leaked out. Two leaked photos of Google's Pixel 8 Pro recently posted to Reddit before being removed. Uh, they showed a new triple camera uh, set up housed entirely in a single glass oval. So the phone's going to be an oval and a new sensor to measure body temperature. It appears that Google has swapped the curved display for a flat one, and the photos are, uh, they were taken down really quickly. So uh, some interesting stuff out there uh, in the world of phones. Now, the question is, how long is it going to take for a Samsung or a an Apple? Because Apple's kind of gotten to the space where they're just, all the same now there there's a few updates but they haven't started changing a whole lot of things uh, the big update uh, for a lot of the phones is everybody's going to that micro c now so yeah. that or that usb c um which i'm glad for especially uh apple user i'm not an apple guy but i'm android uh android guy but um a lot of people that that was the biggest complaint for Apple users is every time they came out with a new phone, they came out with some new configuration in the charging port. Yeah, you know, uh, I think uh, <laughs> it's just another way to uh, sell products. I was I was at the Mall of America here uh, back in March, and they go by the Apple Store, man, and it's just. Everybody's in there, you know, and a good way to introduce new products. Um, you know, the the Pixel Seven Pro was obviously a, a very uh, a very good uh, phone, but uh, it'll be interesting to see now uh, with the Pixel Eight. Um, and then the big thing is, everybody looks at what's the cost going to be. You know, you it's just ridiculous. Or phones out there now. <laughs> oh, a thousand bucks. You're buying a computer, though. You're you're not buying a phone. You're buying a computer. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, how often do you replace your phone? Uh, probably every three years, maybe. So, when the battery starts running a little low. No, I don't or know. Do you you know, I. Or... You know, I I'm one of these guys where I have it on a pavement plan. So, I guess when my when I'm done, I have a chance to sell it back. The, the thing is that once you sell it back, it's like a car buying a new car. You know, once it goes off the lot, that price goes down. So you're not going to get the price that you want. So trading in your old phone uh, for a new one, uh, you know, is uh, I, I have to really think about it and then look at what's what's the advantage, right, of going up to a, uh, a better phone. See, I, I tend to hold on to my phone until I've pretty much worn it out. Although the one I've got right now, my uh, Samsung is, <laughs> I dropped it before I had a case for it. The, the day oh. I bought it, I got home and went, uh, okay, I can live with that little crack. So I'm going to live with that little crack for a long time. Uh, but I tend to wait until uh, I've used it up. And part of the reason is I hate transferring data. Now the clouds made it a lot easier, Yeah, but transferring data and the pictures and and the stuff from my phone to the new phone that that to me is just hateful i i hate doing that so yeah I, that probably plays into a little bit as well i tend to hold on to a phone until it it has outlived its lifespan 
So speaking of of uh, saving data and that kind of stuff, uh, and I know maybe get off topic a little bit, but uh, what are you finding the best uh, platform is for uh, for saving your data on a cloud? Well, I I I'm, I have Verizon, so I just use the Verizon yeah. platform and and, yeah. and Google. I, okay, and you know I utilize the Google quite a bit, but. Uh, how diligent are you, though? Because you have to go and, and make a cognizant effort to go, okay, I'm going to move these photos to this area. And I like things in my hand. I'm I'm a little bit more, call me old school, I, I like tangible things. So yeah. yeah, it took me a long time to figure out. It's like, why was I doubling up a lot of uh, contacts when I would transfer a phone? It's like, well, Google actually solved that for me because I it was a notorious problem that I had, and I just don't save things to the phone anymore. I save them right to the Google platform. Yeah, I'm not very good at at doing that, but the, the nice thing about it is, uh, you uh, you know you're uh, you're protected if something does happen to your phone. You've got all that data and everything saved to the cloud. Yeah, but are you? What's that? Are you? Show, show me the cloud. Where, where's the cloud? Yeah, I know that. <laughs> you know, everybody looks up. I'm going, no, you have yeah. to look down. What, what, if, what if the cloud breaks? You know, I, I like having something. Oh, to, I, I you agree. Know, whether, whether it's a thumb drive or, you know, yep. like photos. And I'm talking mostly photos. But uh, whether it's a thumb drive or a DVD or yep. something tangible. I'm a big thumb drive guy. I like to have, uh, I've got so many thumb drives from, I don't know how far they go back. and I can still pull them up and I have it right there, right? <laughs> well, you used to go to a lot of conferences like I did too. Yeah. And, and everybody was passing out thumb drives back in the day. Yep. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 127. The Tech Ranch as we explore the cutting edge of tech with Marlo and Steve. For more exclusive content, visit thetechranch.com. This is The Tech Ranch. I'm Steve Bach along with Dave Blair sitting in for Marlo Anderson. Rock and Dave Blair. Oh, yeah. Rock and Dave Blair. Sorry, I'm Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's actually my hockey name. <laughs> so how often do you travel by train? Hmm. Man, I don't even remember the last time I traveled by train. I think it was might have been. I went to the Frozen Four hockey tournament in Albany, New York, and we took the train from New York to Albany. It was beautiful uh, along the to Potomac and go up north, and uh, it was fun. I enjoyed. I enjoyed it. You know, how long did it take you to get from New York to oh, Albany? Oh, I think it was probably four hours, something like that. Maybe five. Well, what if it was 40 minutes? Yeah. Well, it wouldn't give me a much of a chance to nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I traveled on the train a lot when I was growing up, the Empire Builder coming through North Dakota. And uh, my, I was on my grandfather's railroad pass. He was a railroad engineer. So I traveled the train out to the West Coast to see family all the time growing up and loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, a lot of people don't take the train because it's a, a little timely. Um, you know, it would take a day and a half for two days where people like to get on a plane and be someplace in three hours. Um, but what if I was to tell you that trains can now go 281 miles an hour? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, um, having to, uh, th there's some good competition there with, uh, airplanes. Because yeah. the nice thing about it is you, you got your luggage, boom, you don't have to check in and go through sec Well, I don't know. Do you think there's well, you still security? still have, have some sort of a security, not not to the same extent. No. But, uh, yeah. You, you've I got mean, your luggage with you. There's no constraints as far as the overhead bin. Uh, you can actually recline in a seat. Um, yeah, you can although, get up it, and it, walk it, around I with... I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out how how your walking ability is going 281 miles an hour. Well, once you're at speed, you're you're fine. It, it compensates for that. So, China's got a brand new high speed maglev train, and it is the world's fastest. It is 281 miles an hour. It just tested at. 
That's that's incredible. Is it uh, run all up? On electric, I assume. Yeah, well, so it's a mag, right. so it's elevated. But yeah. I wonder what kind of power has to be. Uh, there has to be some power utilizing that with magnets and what else? Well, it uses electromagnetic technology to levitate it above the rail, yeah. so no friction. I mean, think about electric vehicles, yeah. and there it's all torque, so yeah. you're not losing anything. Yeah. Well, now there's no friction on the train and that's what increases the speed i'm still trying to figure out how at 281 miles an hour you can break that connectivity at some point so yeah. I, i'm wondering if there's a cap on the on the speed of that train well i've seen it I, i've seen some technology where they have it in a uh, tube right Right. And, you know, now you're, it's like, uh, you know, going to the bank and you put your money in the yeah, you're, tube and boom, it goes. Gerbil tube. Yeah. You know, it's shot tube. with air. And so, you know, I, I haven't seen any of that coming, but I would have ventured to guess that that's probably uh, not that far off. Then you talking about speeds a lot faster than that. <laughs> Well, the funny thing with this is, you know, and we point fingers at China a lot. For, uh, Marlo and I talked about a story last week um, where China has this really bad habit of trying to acquire other people's intellectual property. No, they wouldn't yeah. do that. Well, uh, okay. this <laughs> doesn't contain any technology that is patented or licensed by other train makers. And China's touting themselves as the ability to develop the system through homegrown innovation. Maglev technology is not available everywhere in China, so it's not like you can run on current tracks. The country's still looking to improve travel speeds on existing infrastructure. So um, you have to build all new infrastructure for this stuff. So when you're going to build this high high speed train this levitation train um that that's new tracks new technology um could you see some you know i could see it in a country like china or but could you see the day that there's a new railroad boom i mean if if you if you know your history and you think back and go wait a minute look at the trials and tribulations and the struggles to Across the continent when they laid down the golden spike in the United States. And now you want to replicate that because you're going to have to replicate that. Well, are you? Oh, can, you can go above. You can go high. You know, so now. You, well, yeah, but the higher that? you go, the more power that takes. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, then you don't have the biggest big footprint that you would normally have with a uh, well, you still have rail. to run. You still have to run on a track, though. So, well, like I said, if they start looking at this, uh, uh, the tube transportation, uh, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see because to recreate that, um, I mean, can be really, really challenging. We know that even having two tracks side by side, uh, you know is uh it's challenging just for that whole uh footprint um you know do they uh build a a second level uh so now you have a track above a track you still need support and everything like that i don't know with china you know it's they have you know pretty wide open spaces but the thing um in china is i'm sure that their transportation uh network uh, and their transportation uh, ministry if you want to call it um allow things go to move a little quicker i mean we would have to study that for what five, ten years, and then by that well, time... Uh, and environmental studies and yeah. feasibility studies and study, 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 study yeah. uh, before anything like that could ever start breaking ground on. So, right. yeah, you, you've got countries like China that just get it done. Exactly. There was a, a gentleman I worked with when I was in part of the Central North American Trade Corridor that had designed... Uh, a track to go uh, from the United States up into Canada, across Alaska, into Russia. 
uh, and uh, using high speed uh, there more than anything to move goods. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing in some countries, and I think you might be aware of this, too, is that their track spacing is different uh, than than what we might have in the United States. I don't know if it affects anything in in China and how wide that uh, how wide that track is. Uh, But, uh, man, that's going to be. I would assume that's going to be a challenge. For, yeah, I, I just watched them. a program a couple of weeks ago on the history of why do we have the gauge that we have and the width that we have, and it actually goes back to old England, um, and it it had to do with wagon manufacturers. Yeah, and and what the width on a rut for a wagon was on. Yeah. the roads in England and yeah yeah so like, kind of fascinating uh, speaking of roads um how confident would you be in a vehicle that you didn't have to drive um you could just it would take it, me cuz i know you're a na- big nap guy you yeah. like taking your naps yeah i know that so be if, great. if you could get in the vehicle and you're going to travel 3 hours across the state and you're going to take a nap the whole way could, I, could you trust it well it would take me a while i i think i eventually would but uh you know as far as you know having losing control of of driving i mean that can be a challenge especially for men i'm in control i'm gonna you know uh, i want to make sure that i have uh total control of the vehicle and everything like that unless you're married then we're not in control yeah, of anything that's, but yeah that's true too uh so uh, yeah i think uh it would uh, be uh uh, we know that day's coming, and uh, sure, it would be nice to be able to doze off for a half an hour and and then eventually take over the control of the vehicle again. But it might take me a little bit to uh, to get used to that. How about you? Well, it, it's coming sooner than anybody thinks. And I remember, you know, where I first met Marlo was uh, uh, concerning uh, an autonomous corridor on us 83 and yep and and that plan that's uh, where him and i had met and and it was fascinating well that day is coming sooner than we think uh tesla's full self-driving vehicle it's about to get out of beta testing that means you know they've had iterations of i like to call them more self-driving assist mm-hmm. where you can take your hands off the wheel as long as you're alert paying attention and and Right. If need be, grab the wheel. Um, but this version 12 update of Tesla's, uh, you don't have to grab the wheel anymore. Their their goal of self-driving has really become more... Well, it, it's been vague. Because if you hear about self-driving vehicle, what what do you think of? Well, I mean, if you really look at it, you think of uh, self-driving vehicles that are uh, totally, uh, I guess I would use the word, uh, totally uh, autonomous, but that's not the case. I don't think that that will happen. I think a fully self-driving is I don't need to be in the vehicle. Yeah. You know, that's set it and forget it. It's like you need to go to point B from point A uh, with this package or deliver something or, you know, that's what that vehicle can do. So when I think of full self-driving, it doesn't necessarily have to have a driver, let alone have somebody who's, you know, the ability to nap. Now, it it, because you see on the on the TV commercial, GM's got one with the truck where they do the hand clapping music thing and, yeah. and and i remember my uh my last pickup had a that feature it wasn't to that extent it was an earlier generation of it and you could let go of the wheel about three corrections after the third one you better grab the wheel because it's not going to be able to self correct itself it's come a long way so now yeah. this tesla this this version 12 the question i've got is define self-driving now because is it with or without somebody in the vehicle and because that changes what the definition of self-driving is a great deal doesn't it 
Yeah, I would think so. The interesting thing, too, is what does that look like from a perspective of having an accident that should be preventing accidents from happening? And uh, what does that look like for the insurance industry uh, and how they're going to look at that? Uh, and is it going to cost more for insurance if you're going to yeah. have a self-driving uh, vehicle or not? Um, and then the states have to uh, uh, okay that because uh, each state could uh, could put some uh, regulations in place to say uh, only on interstates, right? Okay, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, who's going to have the final say uh, of uh, allowing autonomous vehicles uh, to uh, drive on the roads? Well, and the better question is, who's going to pay for the roads? Well, yeah, I have a major hiccup on that whole thing with electric vehicles and them not really paying their fair share for being on the road because they don't have any uh, tax at this time. Um, and I shouldn't say every state's not that way. North Dakota doesn't have a have a tax for electric vehicles. You pay for it uh, when you register your car and your registration's higher, but that doesn't do anything for somebody coming from the East Coast going across our roads. They're not getting charged anything for being on our roads. Well, and typically gas tax is what has paid for road that, maintenance. Exactly. So then you have to start looking at, is there a wheel tax or do you build it into the registration? What does that look well, like? Well, you build, I think a simple way is you build it into the charging station. So when you're charging, you're getting billed a little extra for uh, the maintenance of the road. It's an interesting topic on who's going to pay for the roads in the future, but uh, we'll we'll figure it out. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk. 12 Ranch. Let's rejoin Marlo and Steve as they guide us through the fascinating world of technology. You know, it is interesting on who's going to pay for roads in the future and how you pay for those. Because you got to remember, electric vehicles, the, the battery doubles the weight of a vehicle. So you're looking at... Um, 9,000 pounds for a, for a pickup truck, a half-ton pickup truck. It doesn't sound like a half-ton to me. But who pays for the roads? And people don't know this. The biggest destructor of residential roads, garbage trucks. Yep. An extreme amount of weight in a very short wheelbase platform. That, that does more damage to residential roads, which aren't constructed as thoroughfares or co more commercial-grade yeah. roads um, than anything else. So I always wonder, the weight of electric vehicles, what's the, the recourse for utilizing those vehicles on those residential roadways? It, it, um, Typically, my road in front of my house, they redo, and I get assessed for it every seven, eight years. Right. Uh, what's that going to look like in the future? Do they need to build bigger, better, thicker roads? Do they need to redo them more often? That's going to cost me as a, a taxpayer money, and I don't even own one of the electric vehicles. Right. Yeah. So wh wh where does the finances shake out on that? Who's going to pay for those roads? Because I pay for the roads right now. I drive a, a gas-powered vehicle. My gas taxes pay for the upkeep of those roads. In most states, electric vehicles do not pay that road tax because they don't pay a gas tax. Right. Well, it's, it's always been... Um, one of my concerns when, you know, the electric vehicles were being uh, introduced and uh, looking at it from the standpoint of uh, charging stations uh, along the way. I mean, that was a big issue even here in North Dakota 
because if you're traveling and you got an electric vehicle and you're coming out of Detroit and you want to go to Seattle and you have one charging station in North Dakota, I mean, obviously that's changed. Uh, now, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're looking at uh, quite a few more uh, because I think what is the average uh, travel distance for uh, uh, electric cars at like uh, 300 miles or something like that? Yeah. Something like that. So, um, when well, I, I, unless you get the new Dodge pickup truck with the mileage extender option, I, I, I saw a commercial for that. It cracked me up. It's, um, remember seeing all the little memes about, uh, people with a little generator charging up their electric vehicle, yeah. you know, that gas powered generator or yeah. diesel powered generator charging their electric vehicle so they can drive that electric vehicle. And, and Dodge has a feature now that is called a mileage extender option. It's a gas powered generator built into the vehicle. So if I'm you not, run out of power, you can transfer it over. Okay, but and I'm a big fan of Toyota because they stayed this course. Yep. That's a hybrid. Yeah, that, that that that's a hybrid. We already have that now. The cost of that is hey, for another eight thousand dollars, you can get this mileage extender option. Well, why are we recreating the wheel? We've already got that. I, I, I like the the road that, pun intended, uh, the road that uh, Toyota went down because yeah. they stuck with the hybrid models, right? Which made it a lot more sense than yeah. than uh, going down the all electric to me. Yeah, you know, and that's going to be a discussion that's going to go on forever, I think. Uh, I think Marlo ex had an experience, I don't know if he ever uh, told you this or not, but about, uh, you know, running out of oh, yeah. battery power, yeah. right? Try and, and now trying you're Trying to find stranded. a place to charge. Right, you're stranded. So they're going to have uh, electric charging um Tow trucks, right? That can come out and give yeah, you a boost diesel, or diesel whatever. Diesel-powered tow trucks that can come out and give you a little boost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But well, you know, back to the tax. Uh, you know, uh, I think something has to be really looked at, and I'm sure a lot of states are. I when I found out that North Dakota was uh, looking at uh, you know the tax, and you would uh, pay extra for your registration. Well. Again, like I said earlier, it doesn't do anything. That doesn't do us any good for all the other vehicles that aren't registered in North Dakota, uh, you know, and collecting a tax from them. So I think the easiest and best solution would be is uh, when they're charging up uh, in your state, you get uh, you have a fee that you pay or um, they track it from when you cross into and you're, let's just say you're crossing into Fargo and then you exit uh, at beach, there's the amount of time that you have uh, been on that road. Uh, maybe they just add it, uh, add a fee uh, to you because you've used our roads. Okay, now this is sounding a little dangerous because I'm not a fan of wheel taxes, so I'm not paying for per mile traveled, and I'm not a fan of toll roads. And that sounds dangerously close to a toll road to me. You're going you're to pay to drive on this road. I used to live in Michigan, and ironically, uh, the toll roads, if you drive around Chicago, same thing, they're in worse shape than the regular interstates. Yeah. How does that work? Because they're also interstates. Uh, I I saw something really interesting about seven years ago. I was in Singapore, and uh, I was traveling with a guy from North Dakota Trade Office. Um, and anyway, he lived in Singapore and Seattle half the time. And he came and picked me up and at the hotel and got in his car and he had this little box sitting on on his dash and we got on the road in the and the i could see the mechanism kind of the lights were flashing and stuff like that and i'm going uh hey chin the name was chin yang 
uh, what's that all about? And he said, that's our, our charging for driving on this road. Uh, every time we get to a point, uh, <laughs> I get it gets charged, okay? And you have to put your credit card, uh, credit oh, card in. And the interesting thing is during the different hours of the day, they charged more. So if you traveled at the Rush prime hour. time, yeah. you paid more, and then if the uh, the less travel time, you paid less. But you had to have that, otherwise, uh, your car would shut down. So <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about control, but that's the way they uh, you know paid for their road system uh, over there well like I was saying I was a big fan of what Toyota did and Toyota claims that uh, they've made a battery breakthrough and potential boost for electric cars uh, they say that they can have the weight size and cost of the batteries by 2025 so instead of a 9,000 pound battery you're gonna have a 4,500 pound battery so that, that, that could be game-changing well it, it definitely could be I you know, and you know this, I was working on some lithium battery technology here, uh, looking at uh, maybe bringing it to, to North Dakota. And the one thing that that the technology was looking at is uh, not, not having um, more batteries, but having more opportunities for uh, getting more usage out of that battery. Well, especially in climates like ours where uh, winter doesn't treat batteries very well. Yep, exactly. If you have any questions or want to suggest topics for future shows, visit thetechranch.com and send us your thoughts. You can also listen to past episodes and watch exclusive interviews not featured on the radio show. Be sure to follow Marlo and Steve on social media by clicking the links at thetechranch.com. Until next time, keep exploring the world of living with technology. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270. Welcome to July 8th, 2023 on the National Day calendar. Today, we celebrate mighty fruits and staying cool. Your heart performs 365 days a year without missing a beat. So isn't it fair to give back to the hardest working organ in your body? Million Hearts is an organization that's dedicated to preventing 1 million cases of heart disease and stroke in the next five years. Visit their website, millionhearts.hhs.gov, to find out how to take care of your ticker. That's millionhearts.hhs.gov. They say good things come in small packages, and this is especially true of blueberries. Not only are they a popular fruit, blueberries are one of the healthiest things you can eat. This superfood provides more antioxidants than almost any other fruit or vegetable and has been linked to reducing cholesterol. And while you could go on and on, the fact is blueberries are just plain delicious. There's a reason why these juicy berries get a whole month of celebration. You don't hear people getting excited about broccoli season. During National Blueberry Month, check your local farmer's market for this super snack, or better yet, find a patch and pick your own. Flavored sugar water in a plastic tube hardly sounds like a crowd pleaser. But on a hot summer day, there are few things better than a freezer pop. These frozen treats have been around since the 1960s and are a staple for kids around the world who want to stay cool. Flavor Ice is the most popular brand, but you may also know them as Otter Pops, Freezies, or even Zooper Dupers. And if you happen to live down under, you probably don't celebrate your Zooper Dupers till December, when it's summertime in Australia. In fact, you might even leave a few out for Santa. The rest of us are keeping cool by celebrating National Freezer Pop Day in July. So, John, what's your favorite flavor? Cherry limeade. How about you, Anna? Mmm, Poncho Punch. You got all these great names for these. I'm just grape. Hey, tomorrow it's National Sugar Cookie Day. KLXX AM, Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station. Broadcasting from the VIEW Community Credit Union Studio. Here's the latest from ABC News. I'm Dave Packer. A federal and state manhunt after a murder and rape suspect busted out of jail this week. ABC's Michelle Franzen has more. 
Residents in Warren County, Pennsylvania, on alert and on the lookout for 34-year-old Michael Charles Burnham. Police say the dangerous murder suspect escaped from the county jail when he was out in a recreational area using exercise equipment to scale and slip through a metal gated roof. Police are asking residents in Jamestown to check their home video cameras for possible sightings. At the same time, the manhunt is expanding to neighboring New York State. Police admitting they don't know where Burnham is at. Michelle Franz and ABC News. A controversial decision by President Biden in response to urgent requests from Ukraine. ABC's James Longman is in Lviv. Ukraine enters its 500th day of war with a new American promise. The United States will now give Ukraine cluster munitions. Now, this country says they badly need them because their counteroffensive is going slower than anticipated, but this is a very controversial move. These are munitions that are banned in some 120 countries, many of those countries' U.S. allies. Including Great Britain, where Prime Minister Rishi Sunak finds himself threading a needle. The U.K. is signatory to a convention which prohibits the production or use of cluster munitions and discourages their use. We will continue to do our part to support Ukraine against Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen continues her four-day trip to China focused on repairing diplomatic relations between the two economic superpowers while at the same time trying to protect American business interests. ABC's Britt Clendett in Beijing. Yellen's visit follows Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip last month, but the optimistic mood kind of changed after President Biden referred to Chinese leader Xi Jinping as a dictator. Now, Yellen's trip here is another way of kind of showing that the U.S. is serious about getting relations back on track. This is ABC News. Super Talk 1270. Bismarck Area Weather. With your forecast, I'm Corey Hartman. For today, sunshine with highs in the upper 70s. Partly cloudy tonight, lows around 59. For Sunday, sunshine and a high of 87. Could be a little bit breezy from time to time. For Sunday night, mostly clear, lows of 60 degrees. For Monday, sunshine and 82. Grandpa's barbecue sauce is perfect for summer grilling. Get it now at grandpasbbqshop.com. It's 76 at our studios. Question, what will you find on all over-the-counter or OTC medicine packages to help you choose the right drug and use it safely? The answer, the drug facts label. This label lists the medicine's active ingredients and purpose, how much to take, and warnings you should know before using it. Remember, even OTC medicines you buy without a prescription can cause side effects you don't want. So follow the information listed on the drug facts label. For more information, visit fda.gov slash drug facts label. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Conservative talk without apology. The Regular Joe Show with Joe Giganti. Weekday evenings at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome to the Tech Ranch, where we explore the world of living with technology. Get ready to take a deep dive into the latest gadgets, apps, and innovations with your hosts, the guru of geek, Marlo Anderson, and his trusty co-host, Steve Botkin. Join us on this exciting journey, and don't forget to visit thetechranch.com for even more exclusive content. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Marlo and Steve to the Tech Ranch. So, Dave, uh, filling in for Marlo, are, are you, you're uh, familiar with TikTok, right? Yes, a little bit. Okay, I, I don't go on that. Uh, platform, yeah, I, I see the videos. And... <laughs> this is my this is my schoolroom. You know, I'm just learning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually with the TikTok stuff, I, they kind of fall into two categories for me: um, dumb and dangerous. So, so you try, try to avoid e- uh, either one. A lot of those challenges. That's right. Um, well, there's a book talk now. So AI, of course, has opened up a lot of different avenues for a lot of different people, and and it's ever-changing, constantly growing. There's now book talk. Uh, they say it can make bestsellers. Like, boom, done. So ByteDance is becoming a publisher, uh, the owners of book talk. I don't know. You know, where, where does it end at? You know, um, I'm, you know, the best books I ever read are usually biographies, documentaries, but more biographies of people that I I know. Uh, I just enjoy I enjoy that. But now you've got these 
uh, capabilities for AI to uh, do a book on Steve Bakken, right? And feed all that information in pretty soon. That's a boring read. Well, How about Marlo? Mar- Marlo would I, be an interesting it, read. It could be a bestseller on your block. <laughs> 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 uh, they could go, oh, I didn't know Steve was that kind of person. So but, Book okay. Talks, I actually already helped catapult a, a bunch of titles to bestseller lists. Uh, they become a regular topic in quarterly earnings calls at book retailers. Um, Byte Dance, who has done the book talk, has begun soliciting authors to publish their books with its recently launched publishing house, uh, Eighth Note Press. The company's trademark filing for Eighth Note Press describes it as an ecosystem where people can find, buy, read, review, and discuss books. Eighth Note Press reportedly plans to focus on digital publishing with limited print-on-demand runs. So, you like autobiographies. Yep. So, what if I was to say that through AI, there could be a lot more material in that book, more information about that that person, um, because AI could do more diligence, more homework. By the way, I'm not promoting it. I'm just saying. Right. Well, no, and, and I, I know where you're going on that. Um and I guess the uh, the the, bio, the person that uh, biography's been re- uh, written on could either go on. I don't want to have that in the book or not, right? <laughs> uh, so where does that you know put censorship uh, in, in regards to uh, having stuff discussed that maybe you don't want to have have known out there? And then the other thing is. Is it true? I mean, uh, 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 where do you draw the line that they made that up? <laughs> is it fiction or is it fact? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, here's another aspect of this. So if if you've got AI that has the ability to create content, it, it, write, write a book, right? And we're, we're going to talk about autobiographies because that's your space. You like those, and I I do too. Um, how many people who have autobiographies have a ghostwriter? Probably a lot more than you think. A lot. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a there's a ghostwriter, somebody who yep. is a wordsmith that puts the book together. They'll yeah. follow that individual around for a long period of time, and and they'll collaborate with them to come up with the stories or the chapters about certain events in somebody's life. What if you didn't need a ghostwriter now? So you're... You have the ability to write a best-selling autobiography about yourself, yeah. But you're going to have the AI do it. You you don't need that ghostwriter. Well, does that go back to is the AI going to take away jobs? <laughs> well, yeah. Or is it just creating different jobs? Marlon well, and I go back and forth on this all the time. I know, I know that. So, uh, but what is that? I mean, I I, I don't know uh, that. You know, a ghostwriter uh, obviously uh, is somebody that knows, uh, maybe knows a little bit about you, but more than, more importantly, is knows how to put the right words and make them attractive in a Well, they do story. get to know you because that's part of uh, being a ghostwriter is you're going to, it's almost like an a reporter who embeds himself in the story. You're going to be practically living with that individual for four to six months, um, some cases a year, to learn the nuances about somebody so you can write about them with those nuances in your in your words. So, but AI could do that. Yep. And, and how long does it take to train AI to right in your style or yep. you know so those are nuances so that's what a a ghostwriter does right but now you don't have to have somebody live with you for a year to pick up on your little quirks and character flaws and and nuances and the ai can just go okay yeah i'll write it like you'd write it cuz you just tried I, it to I do think that the cool thing for the the bi- the person that the biography is being written about 
is to have that communication with that ghostwriter. Now, they have that opportunity to do it with uh, AI. Uh, I guess uh, you, you're going to have that opportunity uh, through something that we're going to talk about called natural language processing uh, as well. So there's going to be communications, but, you know, I, I think the whole idea of uh, of a, a ghost writer, um, and there might be more than one uh, ghost writer for somebody might hire, you know, you've got that expense then too, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. AI is going to change a little way uh, a lot of things are are looked at and uh well you that's just brought a good... up, you just brought up a communication piece so yep. take a look at what AI from a communications perspective for the ability to interface with program to program that maybe the code was written in uh Chinese or Mandarin or, or and the ability to have that code talk to another code without a language barrier. And we're talking in code terms, but language barrier. That's exactly what you just brought up. Yep. And there's programs out there right now that are playing part of that role, uh, working with AI on the whole communication level. It's managing human computer data log systems. Uh, it's machine perspective too, because you get, machines are going to be talking back and forth, but you still need to have somebody um, doing the work for language classifiers, and um, and then eventually uh, you look at it from the standpoint of, you know, how does this affect uh, the whole process of applications out there? You know, we know that there's smart assistants out there, but they still need to be able to communicate uh, back and forth. Clippy. What's that? Clippy. Remember Clippy? Oh, yeah. That was the, that was the first smart assistant that I can remember, the little paper clip on the... Clippy. Yeah. It's like, hey, you need help with this? Yep. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Boy, has Clippy come a long way. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And then you got document analysis. So you're analyzing stuff, Um, you know, and and I was interesting. This kind of gets off subject a little bit, but the communication from somebody that's speaking English or somebody that's speaking Spanish and there's so many apps and I had some people living with me for a couple months that didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish but the translator app was just incredible I talk into it and they hit Spanish and they would listen to it in Spanish and then they would talk back to me I mean, it, it was a it was a barrier gap that I didn't know how to overcome, but they've obviously overcome that. See, and I told my uh, professor and my teacher in high school that uh, all those years of learning a foreign language just it, it didn't make a lot of sense putting all that time and effort into it. Yeah, there's a program for that now, right? It, there, there is, you know. But how do you, uh, you know, it's it's still nice to know that you can speak uh, very fluently in another language. But uh, with now, you don't even have to. Uh, uh, go to school and take up that foreign language. You just have that translator app with you. Well, I'm a uh, uh, World War II historian. I I love old war movies. And I got sick of reading the subtitles in German. So I took several years of German. I got to the point where I wasn't proficient in the language. I could read it and I could understand it. I couldn't write it and I couldn't speak it. I, simple phrases, but um, I could read it. And, yeah. and I had a trip over to uh, Switzerland several years ago. And, and a lot of those Germanic languages are the foundation for other languages in Europe, whether it's Nor- Norwegian or Danish, Finnish, uh, Swiss. Um, so I had the ability, which was good because we would have gotten the wrong train if I couldn't have. <laughs> yeah. uh, d- did I was able to read that, oh, okay, we need to be on this train at this time to go where we're going because so, but that took me years. Oh, yeah, for sure. 
where I could have just taken a little picture of the thing and translated on my phone now. Yeah. And and let I go AI go. Okay, you're going to go here and here and here. You know, interesting when you're talking about book talk. You talk about publishing too. So, you know, now autobiographies depending on who it's on, you know, might not be as prevalent in the United States as it would be in somebody r reading that anab or that biography in India. But if it's a really famous person, you can translate that using natural language processing where they'll take that English version and translate it into Hindu. Pretty fascinating stuff and very connective. The Tech Ranch. Are you? Tech Ranch. Let's rejoin Marlo and Steve as they guide us through the fascinating world of technology. Steve Bakken in for uh, Marlo Anderson is rocking Dave Blair this afternoon on the Tech Ranch. And we're talking AI at the moment and uh, uh, how AI helps with communication and connectivity. Um, you know, one of the things you just brought up, we were talking during the break, uh, chatbots. Uh, chatbots have really become prevalent. And now you throw that AI twist onto them. Uh, sky's the limit. They can go anywhere. Dave? Oh my gosh, yeah. The whole logistics. I mean, you think about the barriers that have happened when, you know, you were mentioning during the break too about speaking a little, be able to learn a little German and how much that helped a little bit when you were traveling over there and reading signs or understanding where you're at. Um, now that, you know, you're going to have all of that capabilities in your hand, your phone, right? Uh, the mini computer. And uh, so the, the whole thing of, of uh, chatbot and looking at it from the standpoint of the communications, I mean, it's going to be in incredible, make it so much easier for for people on the logistics side of things, um, and just the whole communication on the on the keyboard, uh, I I was I I don't know if I know this answer. Maybe you do, Steve. Is so our phones are set up in English. So phones in China are set up in Mandarin. I believe so. I think that's the primary language. Yeah, so Chinese. so if I got a phone from China, <laughs> well, yeah, it would but be programmed for Mandarin, not programmed for English. I can go into my phone and, and change my language settings. I've got a whole bunch of different language settings, so I can have all my prompts, text, everything in French or Japanese or German or pick a language. So if you're sending, if you want to send a text to a friend in Germany. Um, you can send it to them in German. I think you have to have a program for that within. Yeah, I, I, well, that's but, where but, I'm but getting I, at. I can change my whole preference. So, uh, in the in my settings, in my uh, palette of settings, I can go in and change my user language. So, okay. if I'm going to speak German today, then all the prompts, all the messages, every everything in my phone will turn over to German. Okay. Versus English. So that's just a, a, but as far as the interactive, so I can't imagine there's not programs out there yeah, that, that I, would I do think, that, that would translate for I you. I think there is. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is. You know, the, the other interesting um, talk about chatbots is the whole, um, looking at it from the standpoint of using it business-wise. So, you know, I know Marlo uses this all the time. Hey, Alexis, you know, what time is it? Uh, how cold is it outside? How warm is it outside? Um, well, the other morning it was pretty cold. So. Yeah, it was, it was dang cold, uh, for sure, for North Dakota in July. 5th of July, and there were frost reports. I, yeah. That's just wrong. Well, well North Dakota, is the, uh, July is the only month that has not snowed in North Dakota, and I think we could have done that. We could have gotten really, really day. close, I think, uh, for that to happen. But, 
you know, so those so those uh, platforms out there like uh, Alexis and stuff like that. I'm wondering um, if there's going to be more. I know Marlo's more on top of the uh, of that, but uh, you know, having those communications with you know the robots uh, that he has. Um, and what I'm waiting for is communication back and forth and going. He's got another robot coming, by the way. What's that? He's got another robot coming. He does. Not just Astro. He's got Okay. A, yeah. Yeah. So we, we talked about it uh, uh, in the previous week, and it was pretty fascinating. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. If there's anybody on cutting edge of stuff, it's Marlo Anderson, the guru of geeks. So, uh if he doesn't know about it, then it probably hasn't happened yet. <laughs> you know, you, you talk about the language, and you know, I've talked to people that say that we have one language now. We're we're getting to the place in society where we're going to have one language. Um, so it's not going to be English and French and German and Chinese and Japanese anymore. We're going to have one language, and it's code. Hmm. There's there's those in the tech sector that said the one universal language will be code, and just going back to the communication piece, how do you manage that when you've got the users, those writing code in a different language? Well, to the rescue technology, uh, VLite is a vector database written in less than 200 lines of code. It's Real simple program, but it uses designated, uh, it's designed for agents, chat GPT plugins, other AI apps. Basically, it brings them all together. VLite uses Apple's metal performance shaders uh, via PyTorch to accelerate vector loading and CPU threading to accelerate vector queries. So the chat bots and things like that, you're you're making them faster, you're making them more efficient, and it, it all just ties it together. But a program like that, 200 lines of code, less than 200 lines of code, that, that's, that's crazy. You, you can't do that without AI. There's well, no way to do that without artificial intelligence. Well, you, you, I'm sure there could be a way to do it without AI, but can you imagine what kind of learning curve and stuff you would have to go through to, uh, you know, be able to decipher all those codes and everything? Uh, I mean, it, it's beyond me anyway. I mean, these programmers uh, that have the uh, ability to, uh, you know, write write code. So, you know, uh, the... You know, we were talking about chatbots, and and you know, there's just so many different ones besides the voice one. You've got, uh, you know, the uh, keyboard recognition keywords. You've got the hybrid models. There's there's just so many other platforms out there. Log logistics one, and then the machine learning. Um, you know, as uh, we get into more of the robotics. Uh, teaching the machines to do one thing or another, uh, there again, you go back to AI. And, uh, do they take over that process? So, How secure are you? Because hey, I always throw this back on Marlowe because Skynet's coming or The Matrix or, you know, pick a sci-fi movie. And how secure are you? Because there's a lot of governments now that are looking at putting the clamps on what artificial intelligence can and cannot do. Um, there's a lot of industry people that are doing the same thing. So is it more fear, more innovation? Do we need to slow down? Are we at a good pace? Do you need to just let it run wild? What's your take on that? I, uh, my take is that it's it's so early on. There's so many unknowns about it, and I think that you know, uh, as government looking at it from the standpoint of security, you know, what are they going to have to do to protect uh, their their data uh, more than anything, protect their military capabilities because we know that uh, that's a concern too. So. Yeah, so much unknown on AI. <laughs> a lot of different places it can go, and we'll find out more next. 
the Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270. Technology comes alive. Let's dive back into the conversation with Marlo and Steve. And don't forget to check out thetechranch.com for more. So the security side of it's rather interesting. Uh, you mentioned the government protecting government property. You, you know, what about my intellectual property? Where, where do you draw the line from a security perspective? Well, you know, we're all pretty protective of our of of who we are and our our uh, makeup of of uh, not having some kind of privacy. <laughs> I don't know if that word exists anymore. I don't know if it does either, Dave. Because if you take a look at the privacy, all right, go back to apps. How many? And you mentioned uh, one of your precluding things for apps is your battery usage. Right. Um, uh, my wife just had me install an app, a connectivity app, um, and I'm like, uh-uh, go read the user agreement. They get all of your intellectual property. They own your photos. They own everything else. Not happening. The line for me was, it wanted to change my battery optimization, which means I'm going to blow through batteries like crazy because it would be constantly on and draining the battery. The at battery, my battery optimization in my phone is the controlling factor for a lot of my apps because I'm not going to forego being able to charge my phone once a day or once every other yeah. day for the sake of this app or that app, which while I'm not using, is still draining the battery. And how many times do you use it? I mean, yeah. do you really need it? I get those I, messages. I, I, I get those messages every day. These apps are about to go to sleep yeah. because of inactivity. Yeah. I, I get those every day. And uh, like I told you, I've got to clean my uh, my desktop or my phone apps off because I know it's draining a lot of them, and there's a lot of them I don't use. And I guess if I do need it, I can reinstall it, right? So, yeah. But back back to the security issue, um, you know, that's that's got to be a pretty much a number one concern of of AI is uh, not just on your personal level, but um, also on the uh, government level. Um, and I'll just go back to what I had said earlier on the whole military um, significance of what AI could do and, and uh, alter uh, what could be done launching missiles that shouldn't be launched and all of that uh so I, i'm glad that you know we're looking oh, you don't the, need artificial intelligence for that you can just use a balloon oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a weather balloon that's yeah. all you need old school exactly yeah in fact i'm just wondering if uh that was obviously their technique going on they're not going to worry about us we're just a balloon you know they <laughs> coming from china you know we got more advanced equipment than that yeah, uh, but you know what you can do with a balloon? Have you seen the movie Up? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true, for okay, sure. So from a security perspective, and, and this raised up several years ago, I was aware of this. Um, what kind of a TV do you have? Do you have a smart TV in your house? Yep. Do you ever worry it's watching you? Of course. You know, I've I've, I've always had concerns about because it's got a camera big brother <laughs> uh you know and, and there was just a couple cases in the news last week about people that they were being monitored by their television set yeah. and that information was going well you can just provider. get some duct tape and put it over the camera then right, right. so <laughs> let's take this a step further because apple's got a brand new mac monitor that is going to have an always on display and we'll be able to function as a smart device, like an Alexa, but it's a monitor. So now you've got the the video side of things. Yeah, you know, from a from a privacy perspective. Now, Apple reportedly plans to introduce the an external monitor that can act as a smart home display when the Mac is in sleep mode or shut down, still on. 
Features going to be available on at least one monitor in an upcoming lineup. The upcoming display could potentially run on the iPhone 14 Pro's A16 chip. Apple's also switching. Remember, I, I mentioned earlier about a lot of people going to the, well, everything's going to be eventually going to the USB-C. Um, Apple finally switching the AirPods charging case to USB-C this fall. So, but how would, we've heard the stories about the TV, but now you've got a computer monitor that acting as a smart device in your home that even when it's shut down, it's on. It's always on. Yeah, I, you know, there's Are another. Are you truly alone, Dave? Yep. Uh is that something wherever you go, there you are, right? Yeah. It's just like <laughs> they're going to track you uh, wherever you go. Um, I, I, You know, if you look at it from the standpoint of being on all the time, you know, are you going to burn through that key? Are you going to burn through that uh, monitor a lot faster and going to have to replace it? I mean, it'd be like leaving my phone on all the time. Obviously, it's going to go dead, but... Uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do, I guess it's interesting to look at it from the standpoint of if it's going to be on 24-7, you know, uh, what do you do, unplug it? So All it right. doesn't wait, have wait, any wait, power? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Will that shut it off? Well, probably not, but it batteries are going to eventually wear out, right? Yeah, but... Think of wireless charging. It, it, will it be able to tap into a, a power well, it, source? Well, it'll pull from the atmosphere, right? Because yeah, we got two, static electricity going all over. There's yeah, power there, it, right? It's two feet from a power source, yeah. from a plug-in. Is that close enough? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot smarter people out there trying to figure that out and to uh, tap into all of those. I have two rules things. in my house. Two rules. Yeah. No computers in the bedroom and no yeah. smart TVs. Yeah. Because I got to go through my bedroom to get to my closet from the shower. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> my business partner, uh, he uh, he built a space house in Vegas. Oh, cutting edge. This was 10 years ago on all new stuff. Come in, the lights turn on. He tells the stereo to turn on and everything like that. And um, I asked Scott, I said, so, you know, what what got you to that that point? In fact, uh, me and Marlo, last time we were in Vegas, we drove by the house. He had sold it and stuff like that. And he said, you know, I wanted to take the newest technology available and apply them in my house because I have control over all of that, right? Well, do you? Well, now that was 10 years ago. Now, uh, your computer, or whatever, your TV, <laughs> who knows, maybe even your refrigerator <laughs> has control <laughs> over. Over you. So if I want to get something to eat out of the refrigerator, locks it because they know that uh, I'm not supposed to eat any ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I draw the line at ice cream. All right. so, no, no, the the refrigerator, the freezer, and I would have words. Yeah, that I know that. <laughs> so um, you know, back to uh, this whole security thing. I I just think that we are in, at that point right now is. Who the heck do we trust? And sometimes we even question ourselves. I mean, and so uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very big topic when it comes to uh, looking at AI from the security standpoint. And you know, we always talk about uh, you know the security and cybernet security and all of that. But uh, when one company or one person comes up with some strategies or for cybersecurity, somebody else is figuring out how to break into it, right? Uh, so what's AI is going to be easy. It's going to be easy to do that, I think. <laughs> well, AI will figure out how to hack into something. Yeah, exactly. Like, just like Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, we just mentioned Apple and, and Apple's... So have you seen the... Uh, Vision Pro headsets that Apple came out with. I have not. They're, they're they are VR. V, they're 
It's a conglomeration of all the cutting edge technology. They're crazy. Um, I got to see a set of them, and and it's pretty fascinating. Well, unfortunately, Apple's for, been forced to make cuts to Vision Pro headset production uh, plans. Um, the uh, company is preparing to make fewer than four hundred thousand units in twenty twenty four. A lot of people were lining up for buying these things. They, from a gaming perspective, from a interactive, from a work perspective, um, cutting edge. And, and now it's been cut way back. I, I know people that have been on the waiting list for six months already for these things. And what what kind of costs is associated with? Oh, it, they're spendy. Yeah, they're 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 spendy, but. <laughs> But the market was there. So well, the reason I bring this up is with, are we truly out of the chip shortage? Are we truly out of some of the supply chain issues oh. that we've had? Or are they still lingering out there and we've just been a little insulated from some of them? Well, we went through a lot of that issue right during COVID on the whole supply chain and logistics and getting stuff from one point to another point. And, you know, there hasn't been a lot of discussion of the supply and demand of chips, uh, which uh, is is so important um, across the globe and everything. That I know we people do. that are driving vehicles still waiting for the heated and air conditioned seats because yeah. they don't have the chip for it, but they've oh. had the vehicle for six months yeah. or yeah. close to a year. Wow. I talked to an engineer about a year ago from Minneapolis that uh, we're talking about chips. And he said, you know, and I asked him one simple question, how come the United States can't make chips? And he says, we can, but to program and to get everything in line, it'll probably take us five years to be where uh, you know, Taiwan and stuff is right now on on building or manufacturing those chips. Well, does AI speed that up? Probably. And then are there enough resources? I, I want to talk uh, sometime maybe uh, in the next segment or so about space mining and all of the different um chemicals and and uh, what's out there and minerals that we need to keep surviving because we're running out of a lot of stuff. So the chips are just another um, a aspect of uh, where we are and uh, how much we depend on, you know, those circuit boards and those chips to run things. So, uh, yeah, there again, is AI going to be able to solve that? So the question is, is AI going to be able to circumvent the number of chips? The And there's different levels of chips, but the intensity of chips needed for different things because AI can figure out, for lack of a better term, the life hack for, for doing something? Yeah, but it's like in anything, you still need... A material, right? You still need a mineral or something to make those chips. They can come up with uh, a lot, uh, maybe a lot of ideas of maybe we use a different type of mineral or different type of product to make these chips. Um, you know, so it's it's interesting to look at it from from the standpoint of you know what. Uh, what are we going to need? What are we running out of in this world uh, that uh, we can't live without? Well, well that's we some of the problem I've got with battery technology with the electric vehicles. We don't have the materials right. to produce what they're wanting. Now, we can get into a conversation about the grid and, and the lack of stability in the yeah. grid anyway. And I, I I tell Marlo all the time, just take a look at what a smart house uses for electricity. Yeah, yep. there's some efficiencies, but right. when everything's connected, if I can't get into my house because the electricity's out, I mean, yep. <laughs> but that that's where smart houses are. Everything is connected and that takes electricity. Yep, exactly. So, uh, you know, we have to look at it from a big perspective, too. I mean, our our world's growing. 
now, and more and more people all the time. I think India just surpassed uh, China now. So, you know, there's just going to be more needs out there. More people, more energy, more resources. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270. We're thrilled to have you with us as we continue exploring living with technology alongside Marlo and Steve. So, Dave, you mentioned space mining. You're, you've got to be a little bit more of an expert onto this about the resources that are out there. And we see this all the time from uh, asteroid strikes and, and things that come in contact, meteors that come in contact with our atmosphere and, and wind up landing on Earth. Uh, we've seen what uh, the impact, because the moon is, is a big collector of space rocks and, and collisions. And we find different materials in those items that we come in contact with that we're floating through space or traveling through space. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's similar, but there's some different things out there as well. Um, you mentioned space mining. That That's an interesting piece when you start talking about the, the natural resources that we have available to us on this planet uh, for uh, different battery configurations and, and we don't have enough of the materials it takes to reach some of the lofty goals of the environmentalists when it comes to electric technology, battery technology. Is space the answer? I yeah. mean, you, you've looked into this. It, it, do, can we find everything we need in space? Now, granted, the technology, we got a ways to go. But... Well, I don't know if we have a ways to go. I think that there's been enough research over the years to, uh, ma to make it cost effective. Yeah, got well, a way to yeah, go. I, okay. Uh, I granted that's, that's a given probably, but um, I think that there's been enough studies on all the moon rocks and everything that came back from the moon over the course of what, seven, how many years? So it's 60 years? Since 69. Our, okay. So, you know, uh, and what they've, what they discovered in some of those rocks, um, the amazing um, part of space mining, um, and we can do that uh, when asteroids hit, hit Earth is to really uncover what, minerals they have in them and it's 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 incredible uh some of the some of the different minerals that that they that they have but i mean there's there's companies right now that are looking at launching a um a uh a spaceship to uh it's called astroforge and they're raising 13 million uh to start looking at a test mission uh, to do that uh, to do that mining, um, I got involved with the mining in, um, group here uh, a few years ago down in Arizona, and uh, they were mining uh, gold and silver, and they were from existing mines. And because of technology now, they can go back into some of the cuttings and refine and get pull out more gold and silver and copper but what they were running into was the precious metals of platinum rhodium platinum which are really valuable uh resources out there um, and one of my business partners actually has been working on uh, removing the, those three precious metals from catalytic converters using a process that uh, was invented here in North Dakota uh, to uh, pull those products out there um, and then put them on the market. But it, 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 mining has become a, a bigger thing than a lot of people realize. Uh, even here in North Dakota, uh, all the coal slag, fly ash, you know, they're looking at what's in there. What have we already mined? Now we can pull out, right? 
So what does the space mining look like? Is it a question of going up and capturing uh, objects that are floating through space, like meteors and asteroids, or is it going to the moons of Saturn or uh, going to Mars? You know, NASA's already working on another Mars mission yep. or, you know, to actually put people up right. on Mars. And what is the mining process? Is it all of the above? Is it capturing objects floating through space? Is it going to another celestial body and, and excavating it? What does it look like? Well, I, I would think that it's probably twofold, maybe even threefold, is uh, as you launch a, a spaceship or whatever, a mining ship out there, it can be catching particles on its way. Uh, and we'll just use the moon as an example, um, knowing that we have a lot of information about what is on the moon. Um, but uh, I think that they could capture um, a lot of valuable minerals uh, as they, as they uh, go to the moon. And then once they get there, uh, they can do a collection. Um, a lot of it's going to be is, okay, so how much payload are we going to be able to? to carry, to come back, you know, and what does that look like to refine them down to a small particle and then bring them back. Um, and then I'm sure that they're looking at, you know, what are those minerals that we need the most of right now that we're burning through here in the world? Uh, you know, we always talk about the electric batteries and lithium and that kind of stuff, but there's a lot more components that go into electric batteries than, than lithium. So, um, you know, I think we're trying to do two things, um, refine what we have here on Earth and understanding what uh, minerals that we have that we uh, didn't realize we have. And sand is another example. Um, and then I mentioned coal. And then um, what are we pulling out of the atmosphere here that we could be using? And I know, I don't know if you guys have talked about that whole carbon capture tough, but uh, yeah, it's interesting uh, scenario because we need the minerals uh, to make a lot of the products that we've talked about today. So in some of your research, what are some of the the primary minerals or elements that uh, we find in space? Because it's a little bit different makeup than what we've got here on Earth. So what are some of the new materials out there? Well, you know, it 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 varies a little bit about the capabilities of what we can actually pull in, uh, you know, and and capture. It's almost like a like a filter. I, I've always thought interesting too is, and they've been doing this for years. Is uh, is uh, uh, ocean mining right? And what do we have down there that we can use? Um, you know, there's there's so many different elements out there, uh, and obviously I'm not a scientist, but uh, just reading up on a lot of the things that we're capable of doing now um, and looking at it from the standpoint, is it feasible uh, to do this? Um, is it feasible to do space mining? Um, is it feasible to uh, do mining on on the moon, um, and there's lots of variables that come with that. So um, I can't really answer that question intelligently because uh, there's just so many uh, variables that come in with uh, mining the atmosphere and uh, and what that might look like. Yeah, you know, I look at a mining operation uh, here in North Dakota, the coal mines, yep. and massive operations they're absolutely huge and, and usually smaller equates better to space not uh, not larger so when you're looking at what that scope of that operation would look like that's ginormous if you have any questions or want to suggest topics for future shows visit the techranch.com and send us your thoughts you can also listen to past episodes and watch exclusive interviews not featured on the radio show. Be sure to follow Marlo and Steve on social media by clicking the links at thetechranch.com. Until next time, keep exploring the world of living with technology. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270.
This is Ag Issues with Neil Roberts. Welcome to another edition of Ag Issues. Our guest this week is NDSU weed scientist Brian Jenks from the North Central Research Extension Center. And Brian, kosher control in non-herbicide tolerant soybeans has been a common question this year. What are some options for farmers to consider? In these non-herbicide tolerant soybeans, we don't have the option of a Roundup or Liberty or Dicamba to be the main source for our weed control. And so we don't have a silver bullet post-emergence to control kochia. We really need to rely on the soil applied herbicide to be the foundation of our kochia control. And that would probably start with something like Spartan and Metribuzin. Metribuzin has been a good foundational product. Spartan still works in many areas. Not all of it is resistant. We need to consider using that as our baseline product then come back post-emergence with something like Flexstar, Cobra, Ultra Blazer, Bassagran, spraying weeds when they're less than three inches tall. All right, good stuff. Hey, we'll talk herbicide carryover when we come back. At Northwest Tire, you can get the tires you need for your car, pickup, and almost any other vehicle you drive. But did you know they also do so much more than just tires? Northwest Tire is certified ASC mechanics that can do brakes, alignments, flushes, oil changes, and general engine repair. If you're short on cash, apply for their financing today. Apply in store or at nwtire.com. Deferred interest for six months with any purchase over $149. See store for details. Northwest Tire, tires, and so much more. Northwest Tire keeps you rolling down the road. Summer in North Dakota. Nope, not at the neighbors, Bob. Huh? No bugs. They put in a phantom screen. Oh, how could we get a phantom screen? Ow. Go to OutdoorLivingMinot.com or stop in at Outdoor Living in Barbecue on West Burdick. Phantom screens are perfect for garage doors, patios and porches, lanais and decks, and won't block your view. Did I mention the remote control? Open and close your phantom garage door screen with the touch of a button. Phantom screens at Outdoor Living and Barbecue. 1905 West Burdick or OutdoorLivingMinot.com. Let's now talk herbicide carryover with Brian Jenks on egg issues. And Brian, there have been some suspected herbicide carryover concerns this year. What can you tell us? Anytime we have dry conditions like last summer from, say, June to September, we have dry conditions, low rainfall, we have slower herbicide degradation. Those herbicides that have carryover to 9 to 12 months, we have to be concerned about some of those carrying over to the next year. And some of those might be something like Wide Match, Raptor, Husky, Everest. We need to look at our rotation restrictions and make sure that we're growing a crop that won't be damaged the next year. Good stuff as always. Thanks, Brian. And that'll bring this report to a close. Until next time, I'm Neil Roberts. You've been listening to Ag Issues, brought to you in part by Northwest Tire. Keeps you rolling down the road. By Outdoor Living and Barbecue. And by Bremer Bank. Contact Bremer for all of your ag banking solutions. Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Here's the latest from ABC News. I'm Dave Packer. Secretary of State Janet Yellen in Beijing telling her Chinese counterpart, United States and China should seek a relationship of healthy economic competition that is not winner take all, but with a fair set of rules would benefit both our countries over time. The State Department says Yellen also conveyed that even when the United States and China have disagreements, it's vital that the two countries find ways to work together 
on issues of shared and global concern. No survivors after a business jet crashed this morning in Southern California. In Southern California, no word on what caused the Cessna business jet to crash Saturday near the French Valley Airport in Murrieta, south of Riverside. All six on board died. Emergency calls after the crash captured on Broadcastify as deputies located the plane. Our CLSR is uh, one aircraft down in the middle of the field, uh, fully engulfed. The NTSB now in charge of finding out what went wrong. It is the second plane crash in the past week near the regional airport on July 4th. A small plane crash shortly after takeoff, killing one and injuring three others. Michelle Franzen, ABC News. Federal and state agencies are asking residents in Warren County, Pennsylvania to check their home cameras as the desperate search continues for a murder suspect to escape from jail this week. Police say 34-year-old accused murderer Michael Charles Burham is considered very dangerous. Burham escaped from the prison through the recreational area using exercise equipment through a metal gated roof. Authorities in Pennsylvania and bordering New York are now in a desperate search to find him. Last seen wearing an orange and white jumpsuit, a denim jacket and Crocs. ABC's Jacqueline Lee airstrike in a Sudanese city neighboring the capital Khartoum today killing at least 22 people, say health authorities. It's one of the deadliest airstrikes yet in the three months of fighting between the country's rival generals. This is ABC News. Super Talk 1270, Bismarck Area Weather. With your forecast, I'm Corey Hartman. For today, sunshine with highs in the upper 70s. Partly cloudy tonight, lows around 59. For Sunday, sunshine and a high of 87. Could be a little bit breezy from time to time. For Sunday night, mostly clear, lows of 60 degrees. For Monday, sunshine and 82. Grandpa's barbecue sauce is perfect for summer grilling. Get it now at grandpasbbqshop.com. Currently, 78 degrees. Just In communities across North Dakota, AM radio stations like ours are vital connections to emergency information, weather updates, local news, sports, and entertainment. And we need your help. Text AM to 52886. That's text AM to 52886. And tell Congress to keep AM radios in cars. This ad is aired by the North Dakota Broadcasters Association and this station. Program schedule, updated local news, sports, contests, and more. Visit today at supertalk1270.com. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome to the Tech Ranch, where we explore the world of living with technology. Get ready to take a deep dive into the latest gadgets, apps, and innovations with your hosts, the guru of geek, Marlo Anderson, and his trusty co-host, Steve Botkin. Join us on this exciting journey, and don't forget to visit thetechranch.com for even more exclusive content. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Marlo and Steve to the Tech Ranch. You know, just to finish up on uh, the online security with AI and what that looks like, Google's actually come out now uh, saying that it's going to scrape everything you post for AI. So it's going to try to identify whether artificial intelligence is involved in what you're posting is. So Google's recently updated privacy policy says that the company reserves the right to scrape everything anyone posts online to build its AI tools. So they're going to take all of your information, all of your knowledge, and let their AI learn with it. Mm. Wow. You know... uh, So it's going to get smarter because of you. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Have you seen some of the stuff people post on TikTok? I don't think it's going to get smarter. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, how, you know, what do what do they say we use? What one tenth of our brain? I think if some that. people use one half of one tenth of their brain. Common sense is the best thing. <laughs> oh, you know, so AI has has made a lot of strides really quickly, and one of the places that uh, AI has has done some promising promising work is in the medical field you take a look at the innovation out there or the ability to come up with a cure or a a medical procedure that's going to improve somebody's life because um we haven't come up with the the cure for diabetes yet or multiple sclerosis or all these different diseases that are out there but 
AI is is going to give a leg up and an opportunity to to innovate even faster, to do research faster, more efficiently. Um, one of the places that I, I, I find out, we were talking about cameras. I mean, uh, this is kind of interesting. We were talking about cameras earlier in the program yeah. um, with the new Google camera. Well, now, so one of the things that uh, the medical community has always been trying to do is get a better picture, a better insight into the workings of the human body. And whether it's a PET scan or, you know, these different machines you got to go into and, and it gets a pretty good picture of what's going on. Well, now there's a camera that could look into your brain, right? Which I'm not sure I want a camera looking into my brain because I'm afraid of what that picture is going to look like. Yeah. Uh, but there's a single uh, photon camera that could peer into your brain. So superconductor-based cameras have remained confined to the laboratory over the past two decades due to the inability to scale them past a few pixels. Well, AI to the rescue. Um, a team at the National Institute of Standards and Technology has created a 0.4 megapixel single photon camera that could transition wow. superconductor-based cameras from a lab curiosity to an industrial technology coming soon to a medical facility near you. That 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 is absolutely incredible from a from a technology perspective. Uh, in fact, the technology could be used for space imaging measuring light in phototonic uh, quantum computers, uh, looking into the brain with non-invasive light-based techniques. Uh, the team's now working closely with several bioimaging groups to adapt the device to various applications. Um, advances in, in medical, medical advances with AI, uh, absolutely yeah. life-changing, oh. Dave. You know... On the other side of that is the implant of chips into your body, into the brain. I'm not going there. I know. But this goes back to Elon Musk. He came up with a chip to be implanted into the brain to actively uh, look at the brain functions. And uh, I think the first patient and I'm uh, don't quote me on this they were going to start implanting last year I haven't followed up much on that but the whole idea of having something artificial in your body um, scares me a little bit I mean I can get by with my artificial hip with that I got but I, I got an artificial shoulder okay. so we, so we got artificial stuff all exactly. over the place but not but, smart artificial stuff. Yeah, but this neurotechnology that uh, that's really hitting the uh, medical community is is looking at prevention of some of these diseases, whether it's Parkinson's or whether it's autism, uh, dementia, all of those. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not a fan of of uh having implants uh because uh i uh i truly believe that uh we're messing with something we shouldn't be messing with god created a body and and uh we've done a good job of probably destroying it but uh we i think we have to be really really careful of what we're uh artificial stuff that we're putting into our body I, i'm not a believer in uh in um eye scans either i i would never ever have one now <laughs> that doesn't mean that maybe it's it's happened uh you know obviously we got fingerprints uh we got voice recognition um but this whole eye recognition um there again this kind of scares me a, a little bit are there going to be breakthroughs in in a lot of this uh and creating a uh a society where 
uh, we uh, implant a chip and it takes away c- cancer or it stimulates the brain to that uh, that it subsides with uh, Parkinson's disorder or MS. Um, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's a path that uh, I know we're going down. I'm not sure if it's the right path or not, but. <laughs> so for me, a lot of it comes back to scalability. So you take a look at the ability to, to take a chip that uh, – great example uh this is like the next generation from a pacemaker so a pacemaker regulates your electrical impulses in your heart Mm -hmm. so if parkinson's was a, a disruption of the connections in your electrical system in your brain and you have the ability to put a microchip in to fix that you know, is that a positive? Is it a? I I think there's a lot of lot of room to learn, and a lot of room to try to figure out what the correct path is from a. What do you mess with? You know, what do you what do you really? Yep. Is there a yep. line to cross, Dave? And what are the consequences that come with that? You know, who's going to be, and I'm sure, you know, we see all of these applications for doing tests on this drug or this product or whatever, you know, the the guinea pigs out there, Um, you know, but so much of that is... uh, Everybody's body's different too, right? So, what one what might work for one person might not well, and, work and, for and, another. And I'm a firm believer. It's like the one size fits all does not fit. No, nope. and, and especially when you come to healthcare, you, you take a look at you know here take a pill for that. Well, yeah, but is it the same pill for everybody? Probably not. I mean, the dosing is going to be a little yeah. bit different. How people react to things are a little bit different. Um, yeah. Do you need to tweak something a little bit to make it work for you? And, and you can have experts, doctors, that argue for it and against it, you know? Right. And, and we we saw that happen with COVID and all of that as well. So, Well, now, you, now layer in artificial intelligence on that. So yep. you've got AI making that split-second micro determination that okay you need this many milligrams not that many milligrams so that blanket pill that um, is prescribed now it's personalized it, it's just for you it, it's you know you talked about uh, I talked a little bit about the chip the other technology that's been around for a while but it's starting to be used more as virtual reality in the medical society. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it looks at the anxiety of, uh, that we have and stress, and, and it can um, kind of look at it from a different aspect of uh, what might be happening. And, you know, virtual reality is, uh, is kind of an interesting thing topic in itself but uh, medicine now has been using it in uh in teaching um and training um mechanisms for uh you know treating different uh disorders and uh you know that's not so invasive um as a as a chip but uh you know back to what you said about ai yeah uh there's going to be a lot of of uh topics based not just on the security of ai but what's it going to do to the human race, what could it do? Well, and I look at it in terms of, you know, there's a Hippocratic Oath, you're not to do harm, you're supposed to, you know, is there a line to cross that, you know, some things you shouldn't mess with or um, damn the torpedoes in full speed ahead when it comes to uh, saving a life, but, you know... You know, I always go back to movies. It's like, think RoboCop. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. okay, at what cost? 
Yep. And, you know, who's... Who is going to be the first one? I, <laughs> I remember having talk about surgery, asking your surgeon, how many surgeries have you done on the hip? And he's going, you'll be my first one. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't think I'm going to use you. Maybe go a different route. The Tech Ranch. What if you get ready for more amazing tech insights from the guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. We're talking about medical advances due to artificial intelligence, AI, and you know we talk about things you put in the body, a, a, a chip, or or you know putting things in or, or looking in. You know, one of the other advances that has come out of AI is what can you pull out of the body? So, do you have a bad piece of DNA and you can pull it out from somewhere, a good piece, and, and put it back in and fix a disease or, or fix an ailment of some sort? Um, this was interesting. I came across this article. Uh, researchers at Yale. Um, in the University of California, San Francisco, found that a single injection of a protein called Clotho led to improvements in cognitive function in older monkeys. Now, why this is important? Dementia. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's rather interesting. So Clotho is produced by the kidney, and it helps regulate the kidneys and the metabolism. So humans with higher levels of the protein perform better in cognitive tests. Protein may help in rejuvenating brain function in older adults. So now you're looking at a medical advance that has identified something already within your body that can fix your body. So it's about the pathways at that point. So you're taking a protein out of some place and relocating it to the brain. And they think this might be some pretty fascinating advances in helping dementia patients. Well, you know, we know that uh, the studies have shown a lot of issues that come with dementia, you know, whether it's uh, too much sugar in your system or um, is it hereditary or whatever. But, you know, I'm a firm believer. God created a perfect body. We've destroyed We've it. We've destroyed it. We yeah. destroyed it ourselves. <laughs> so how can we take something that we have too much of here and and move it to there. And I, I mean, that's what I'm, that's what I'm picking yeah, up on. Think of, think, so you just said it best. Uh, it, uh, God created a perfect body and we've destroyed it. So in that process of, of screwing things up, because that's what we do as humans, uh, in the process of screwing things up, uh, did we block a pathway that naturally was there for that kidney protein to get to the brain? Did we screw up? Because there's a lot of different connectivity within the body and in different systems. Have we screwed up those pathways? Because I, I, I put a lot of things back on preservatives and, mm -hmm. and, and it goes back to the late 40s. You know, a lot of that came around with World War II on, on preserving food for, right. for the troops and into the 50s. And then it turned into a convenience because, good Lord, we're lazy. Um, so have we blocked some of those natural pathways? So medically, is there the ability to not replace something, but but fix something that was broken in the first place? I We don't know, but could artificial intelligence define that for us could it could it find out if okay because of these preservatives or whatever it is we've just blocked a natural pathway yeah. that prevented dementia because the those proteins got to the brain yep. and did we just screw up that path and yeah in a lot of cases we we probably have i've done a lot of research on stem cells um with my daughter having ms um, looking at some breakthroughs there. Stem cells are amazing technology, and I'll give you a quick example. My, it's almost like a reset because it's like here's where you were when things weren't screwed up because of all the, the crap that you added exactly, in later. Exactly, and as we get older, our stem cells diminish more. You know, so then what happens is our um, our immune system gets compromised too 
So they, they've done so much work in that whole arena of stem cells, but my former boss had a very uh, dangerous blood disorder, cancer, um, and I know you were talking about your, uh, your stepfather, uh, but anyway, uh, he had gone, and they were just doing this pretty early on about five years ago, where they take your stem cells. Seattle was kind of the leading technology hospital. They take your stem cells, and they're doing it today, getting better at it, and they clean them up. Tell me, I don't know how they do it, and they re-inject them into your system. A lot of athletes are doing it for, you know, shoulders and knees and that kind of stuff. Anyway, they showed some improvement, but not enough that he was getting rid of his uh, uh, his uh, uh, cancerous blood cells. So there was a new technology developed in in Germany where they would check out somebody else's DNA and match it up with yours and use their stem cells, uh, good stem cells to in, inject into your system. And he went through that therapy and boom, he came out cancer free after three months. Okay. Um, um, amazing. Well, I came across this product that, um, actually stimulates your own stem cells it's a patch i wear every day and uh it's been it's been really amazing how how much difference i've gotten on my energy levels really um better than it's ever been i have some aches and pains in my knee uh that uh i think at some time i might have to look, have it seriously looked at but those aches and pains have gone i know a friend of mine that has uh, rheumatoid arthritis all of her knots on her knuckles and and feet have have disappeared be using this stem cell it's a, a patch that a doctor uh invented a few years ago and um <laughs> i don't know if this is a good plug or not but mike lindell is is on it and he got his whole staff on these patches and he said i'm getting more productivity than i ever have uh having these people on these uh patches so we're making more pillows folks <laughs> yeah he watch it no there's something else coming i don't know what it's gonna be uh slippers right um yeah, which he already has but well. anyway uh so technology and this came from a doctor it didn't come from ai he did the re search and put the time and effort into it now would ai have speeded that up to get it to that point probably but uh anyway uh yeah i mean we've talked about ai almost all well, this well, last couple segments and uh it, it's going to be good but we have to be really careful about it too you know, when you start looking at uh, the different advancements and innovation out there it, from an AI perspective, it's it has a bad connotation. So I don't really want to say shortcut, but it gives you the ability to truncate a lot of research to shorten up what that that process looks like from a diligence perspective so you know from that example you can make some pretty fascinating strides in, in medical technology pretty quickly well, there's no question about it but are the you know i always question okay is is ai perfect no it, no it, 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 it's not i mean <laughs> I still go back to the, you know, the vaccine or the shot, you know, how fast they fast tracked that. And uh, was that good or bad? Uh, I think it was bad. But anyway. <laughs> well, innovation is, uh, is something that's constantly evolving. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270. Technology is our passion. Let's jump back into the conversation with Marlo and Steve. So when you're talking medical innovations, one of the things you have to talk about, because I think they're, they're going to be very, very coupled closely together, 
is the artificial intelligence and the robotics side of things. The robotics have gotten absolutely fascinating. And you take a look at the surgeries they're able to do because of um, the robotics and, and the the micro side of things. You you can do tiny, tiny repairs mm-hmm. with robotics. Um, AI is just going to accentuate that. Um, a lot of that started with three something as simple as a 3D printer mm-hmm. uh, where you were able to go in and recreate organs or different uh, parts of the body. Prosthetics. Prosthetics. Yeah. And, you know, so we think of where we are today, but going back to the roots, 3D printing really made a huge difference. It's incredible. Um, I would venture to guess that if you're out um, at a you know at a resort or something like that, and they have all these uh, shops. Uh, to buy trinkets and whatever, uh, how many of those have now been 3D printed, which aren't invasive at all. I mean, I guess unless you swallow them. But um, the 3D printing has just come so far, and the precision that comes with it, and that goes back to the, uh, you know, the whole technology of robotics and what does that mean, but... You know now the 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 uh, the um, medical community has been using 3D even more, and this was interesting. They'll take a picture of your body, and then they'll recreate that body in a 3D form, and they can do the operations prior to practice, you know, which is great, man. Like I said, I don't want to be number one, you know, I'd rather be number one million, but um, they can, and then they can decide because everybody's body's a little different, what technology they might have to use for replacing this organ or doing something with this vein. Uh, And, you know, that in, in itself has come so, so far. Um, you know, we're, you know, they're on the edge of uh, creating uh, organs that um, that can replace the organ that you have. Now, there again, you know, it's all a trial and error, but uh, like with my daughter, not just having MS, she's a type 1 diabetic. Her pancreas doesn't produce insulin. But they're working on um, making artificial pancreas that will then produce insulin. So that that breakthrough is uh, I- incredible. Uh, and again, you go back to AI. I, you know, what is that going to mean uh, in the in the future for um, you know the human body? You know, I I always think of one disability that I think would be the worst and that would be being blind right I mean yeah not being able to talk not being able to hear but anyway can you imagine having uh, a new eye and you know yeah. it put in your body and the key is will your body reject it or not right because that's always the problem (laughs) i had this conversation i I have a friend of mine uh university of colorado boulder and she was north dakota um she was working on the team in france remember when they cloned the human ear on the back of a rat yeah yeah, she worked on that project. Okay. <laughs> um, so from a genetic engineering perspective, and she told me the laborious process they went through from um, just from a, a, a scientific perspective and how much quicker that process would have been with the 3D printers or the artificial intelligence or the robotics that are out there now. Um it wouldn't have been years and years and years in the making. It would have been a much quicker process and probably not as big a deal. But if you go back into the medical world and, and take a look at what that research did for burn victims mm-hmm. and, and other, it was groundbreaking research. It, just the ability to 
grow and graft a, a human ear on the back of another species, let alone you know, another human. <laughs> Well, look at, you know, how far we've come with all the different transplants that are available out there, too. And there again, it's, you know, back to, you know, everybody's body being different. But, you know, is your body going to reject this transplant or not? And, you know, they they always had issues with heart transplants and, and uh, even liver transplants because now you're putting something in that your body doesn't recognize. But, yeah, um, and we've come so far in being able to create a 3D uh, image. And, and I, I, you know, everybody thinks, oh, a 3D image is all plastic. Well, yeah, but there's a lot more to it than that, how precise and everything that they can that they can get so well and the materials i mean you you mentioned the plastic okay so if you're doing a knee replacement or um a little part that you have to replace uh, a bone you can do it with a plastic that but it's gotten to the point where there's other materials that it can be utilized exactly. so can you make a a ligament um, yeah, you can. can. Can you? There's a lot of different things out there that you can make. I, I would really hoping they can get to cartilage soon for my knees, but because uh, <laughs> I don't want to replace my knees, but yeah. just replace the component. Uh, 3D printing is where that started. That that that's been the impetus to a lot of that. Yep, and I think we're going to continue to see more and more of that, not just on the medical side, but you know on every side, transportation side of it, uh, that uh, make a big difference out there as, as well. But uh, yeah, um, 3D printing has made a big difference in our society today, for sure. So fast forward that to the robotic side of stuff and artificial intelligence. So uh, the ability of artificial intelligence to improve 3D printing, the ability of artificial intelligence to pr improve the robotics or the genetics. And, and the genetics is where I start getting a little, uh, it, it gets a little iffy for me from a, from a biblical perspective. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of screwing with DNA. Uh, that, that's God's job. Uh, but when you have the ability to, what, create new species? Um, mm. Jurassic Park, could that really happen? Yeah, it could. I mean, th there's so many different places to go from a medical perspective. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence in the medical world, and and the applications across the artificial intelligence space in healthcare and the uses um, it, it's, it's really limitless. I mean, some of the places that they're looking and doing a lot of research right now, um, accurate cancer diagnosis, the ability to go and, and, and diagnose somebody who has cancer or somebody that's going to have cancer. Artificial intelligence plays a big role in that. Um, early diagnosis of fatal blood diseases, um, you mentioned the chatbots earlier, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the customer service side of stuff. You you take healthcare and we're chatbot and um, remote medical care. Uh, we live in, in rural areas and the ability to have uh, instantaneous medical care or at least consulting without a three hour drive in a in a critical situation that's life altering for a lot of people well yeah and you know as you know your own personal virtual health assistant yeah exactly uh a live-in nurse <laughs> well we talked about you know we didn't get into it but we were visiting a little bit about telemedicine and how you know in the past, living out in the country away from medical community would make it really challenging. Now, that's not the case. I mean, if you've got a phone, um, you can be talking to your doctor. You can probably be sending him pictures or images of, uh, of, what's, of what you have going on there. So that whole um, 
So that whole telemedicine um, has really uh, increased the uh, longevity, I guess, of people that are somewhat isolated. We'll go a step further now. What if you were to have a, a personal health care? So instead of virtual health care, you had a robot that worked for your doctor that managed your health care in your home. So what does that do to the, the nursing home scenario? The ability for people to, because that's a big focus in, in long um, long term he- health care is yep. how do you keep people in their homes longer? Yep. Because that mitigates costs, mitigates resources. Uh, the ability to do that, okay, does a, a virtual robot yep. health care assistant. No, you know, I mean, I think that's the. I think that could be the future. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Again, with my daughter having a lot of medical issues, trying to remember when she's got to take her insulin and all her pills and stuff like that. You know, if I had uh, uh, a nurse that would come in and do that, great. But, man, and she qualifies for that. But trying to find that person like that is almost impossible. You know, that that whole area of uh, workforce um, in nursing homes, nurses, CNAs. So if you had this robot that would be there to either remind her that she needs to take her medication or she act, they actually injects the medication for her um, and reminds her she's got to take her pills or brings the pills to her. I mean, she's confined to a wheelchair, so uh, just having that. But the big issue that comes with somebody like her with her disabilities is the loneliness. So if you had a robot that you could talk to and play cards with or read a book and discuss it, I mean, all of those things, you bring that human, somewhat of a human element into uh, that equation. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. You know, think of uh, how many times have you had a CT scan or X-rays, and you got to wait until um, somebody has to read those. Right. Well, artificial intelligence can do it right away. You know, on on the spot diagnosing of of, yep. of conditions. Yeah. New yeah. Medi- new medications. Um, you know, we talk about the uh, the ability to personalize your health care and you know the one size fits all pill I'm not a big believer in right. but you've got an artificial intelligence assistant that could dose correctly uh, because sometimes less is more you're, you're better off having a lower dose of, of something you know look what happened with the opioid crisis um, could artificial intelligence prevented that um, I don't know if it always prevents people's greed, but yeah. but but could it have prevented that because it would know that uh, the dosing at the rates that it was being prescribed was addictive, you know? So you've got some different. I always kind of look at things from a, a certain lens, and I try to go on the other side of an issue and look at look at it from that lens, from, from the other side of, a, of a, a, an issue, a problem, or uh, the equation. Um, artificial intelligence has that ability to do all different angles in, from below and above and then the side and this side and that, all at the same time. So from a cognitive problem-solving perspective, it, it, the opportunities out there are fascinating. Yeah, and and it kind of goes back to the whole idea is, will artificial intelligence make our life better? I hope so. Um, And what does that look like? But more importantly is, can it determine what might be happening to my body prior to it happening? Okay, and my daughter gets urinary tract infection. Could it trigger something to saying hey she's got to get on antibiotics now because she's got a urinary tract infection happening so just pre pre branded of medicine right well i I don't know if it's going to tell you you're about to get hit by a truck but uh, (laughs) we can hope yeah the tech ranch super talk 1270 get back to discovering the latest in technology with the guru of geek marlo anderson 
So we've been talking about artificial intelligence and where it can go as a tool and lead us. Now, of course, it all started with ChatGPT and ChatGPT started out of the gate as the first one. They just dropped before everybody else. And there was a lot of buzz about it. Was it a novelty or because I could see on the scientific side of where a lot of things can go with artificial intelligence, how it can help. But uh, chat GPT has dropped about 10 percent. The traffic's declined for the first time from May to June. Uh, worldwide unique visitors to the site have dropped by 5.7 percent with the amount of time spent on the site down about 8.5 percent. Uh, chat GPT still attracts more visitors than Bing.com. Uh, charts showing that Chat GPT's growth and recent decline are available. Um, you know, is it a novelty? I, I, people just experimenting because I haven't seen a lot of the other artificial intelligence. Because we know Google's coming out and Microsoft and all these different platforms. Um, eh, they're not out yet. But the numbers of use is dropping. So two questions. Was it a novelty or is it a novelty? And second of all, are, are people bored or constrained with the use of artificial intelligence like a chat GPT? Well, from my perspective, I, I look at it that it's still so much, like I've said in the past, unknown. Still new. There's an education process, I think, that needs to really uh, be addressed. So, so uh, great, great observation, Dave. My question is, is there an education process that needs to take place for those that are trying to educate artificial intelligence because you have to train and Marlo and I have talked about this a lot. He's trained different chat GPT entities for this project or this project right. or this project. Is there an education portion that needs to take place with the public or are people lazy because you have to know how to ask it the right questions, right? And actually, the University of Texas has just opened up a, a, a master's program on artificial intelligence, how to communicate with artificial intelligence so that you can control right. artificial intelligence better. You can get a degree in that now. Yeah. Uh, so, well. But is there a learning curve for those that are trying to introduce a learning curve? Well, everybody's going to pick up and look at it from a different perspective and say, I, I, I could care less <laughs> about AI. Now, that's not a good um, observation from their point of view. I think that the more that they understand it, the more they can maybe ask intelligent questions. Uh, but I think the community as a whole, um, you know, the education process, you know, I guess if you want to call it train the trainer, uh, you know, that that needs to be um, working with AI and what does that what does it look like? I think the business community, me and Marlo talked about this too, that I think we need to put on a seminar or some kind of event here uh, about AI and um, and look at it from a whole bunch of different perspectives. But, you know, the whether it's a trend or a fad, um, I think anything new um, can be, but it's so complex that, you know, a lot of average person I think is going to go, that's way above my head. I, I have no idea, um, you know, what they're, what they're talking about. Um, but I think setting up uh, some kind of a, a site and, you know, obviously you can go to Google all day long and Google artificial intelligence and you're going to get this huge list of you know, what it does, what it's capable of doing and everything like that. Um, and sometimes when people don't understand it, they they don't accept it, right? <laughs> they move on. So... Are there a couple different camps of people? Because there's people like Marlo that utilize it as a tool it, to, right. to a great extent. Yep. Um, 
kids were looking at it from, oh, hey, I can do my homework. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a group of people that just, okay, hey, this is cool, and then just drop off with usage. Is it because of a lack of understanding or a lack of – because for me to utilize artificial intelligence – uh, a chat GPT we're talking about right now, but to be able to fully utilize artificial intelligence, you got to have a little creative side to your brain. You you got to start thinking in some different ways to push it and pull it and knead it and and make it perform a little differently. How that fits to your needs? I I I I really think mm-hmm. there's a creative side of the brain that needs to get engaged to utilize artificial intelligence correctly. Well, I think if once you understand it, you're going, wow, I can use this. I can use AI in in this to help me um, in what I'm doing, whether uh, it's uh, taking a new class. Or you need something. to remove constraints. I mean, yeah. I, really, there's no limits. Yeah. Yeah. But I still think <laughs> uh, I go back to, you know, my whole spiritual uh, views. I mean, we have a brain, and we need to use it. And um, uh, is AI going to take away some of that uh, creativity that God has given us um, to uh, to interpret things and to say things and to visualize things? Uh, that that whole creativity um, does that go away with AI? Because AI is almost one size fits all. I, I mean, do you not understand? a fan of one size fits all. Well, what I'm saying is that AI, from my perspective, can do everything that we can do. Okay, so here's the, here's the trap, Dave. And humans are inherently lazy. So does that make society worse, or does it make society better? Uh, do you utilize artificial intelligence to be lazier or do you utilize artificial intelligence to innovate more? It's a slippery slope. Yeah. I remember the movie Idiocracy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it could go either way. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I think that AI as a whole... And as much as I know about it, um, if we use properly, you know, will be a hu- a very useful tool. Now, is that is that going to make a difference in how we live? Uh, uh, probably, but I'm I'm still a firm believer that uh, uh, God gave us uh, a perfect body. We destroyed it. Gave us an awesome mind and with brain power. Are are we not going to take advantage of that, of that anymore? And uh, well, like you said, we're only using ten percent of our brain power, it, right. if that. Right. So. So is AI the magic bullet to unlock the rest of that? <laughs> oh, only time will tell, right? AI. <laughs> yes, the only time will tell. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks, Steve. And that's a wrap on another fantastic episode of The Tech Ranch. Remember, if you have any questions or want to suggest topics for future shows, visit thetechranch.com and send us your thoughts. You can also listen to past episodes and watch exclusive interviews not featured on the radio show. Be sure to follow Marlo and Steve on social media by clicking the links at thetechranch.com. Until next time, keep exploring the world of living with technology. The Tech Ranch. Super Talk 1270.